conducted and today we are fortunate to have with us our guest speaker dr k b venkatesh to deliver a talk on systems biology linking genotype to phenotype a subject with its uh, title appears to be totally from the subject domain of biology but when you read it further and again you realize that it connects to all of us when it is talking about the genotype and phenotype i would like to express our gratitude to our guest speaker for accepting our invitation to deliver this talk and we are all eagerly waiting to listen to sir i request dr purushottam kale to formally introduce our guest speaker today kale sir thank you himanshu namaskar i am professor purushottam kale on behalf of atbs and on behalf of ram janmanjan junyurwala college i welcome the guest speaker professor venkatesh as well as the listeners and the participants it's my pleasure to introduce to you professor venkatesh vk he uh, is a professor in the department of chemical engineering at iit bombay he graduated and post graduated from iit madras and completed his doctoral work from university of purdue usa since 1993 he has been a faculty at iit bombay his area of expertise is in systems biology applying engineering systems and principles to biological phenomena he has developed novel theoretical platforms to understand the underlying design of principles in nature thereby linking networks in microorganisms as well as higher organisms he has close to 200 peer reviewed publications in reputed journals he has won several accolades including swarna jayanti fellowship insa young scientist and ima young engineers awards he has been elected fellow of national science academy he has incubated a startup by the name metflux research private limited which offers specialized applications using systems physiology models in drug discovery disease management and wellness it would be a real pleasure listening to the engineering aspects of biology and we are all eager to hear this from professor venkatesh vk professor venkatesh please professor venkatesh you may please start your presentation you are able to see yes yes sir and you are also able to hear clearly right absolutely yeah. okay okay excellent yeah thanks a lot uh, professor kale for that uh, kind introduction uh, i am uh, very happy to present my uh, my area of research and also give you some of the things that we have been working on at iit bombay um, so you will get a different perspective of biology uh you, you can understand that i am an engineer and who has uh, tried to put engineering principles into biology so uh, uh, obviously that makes me uh, forces me to learn a lot of biological principles uh, to to understand how nature designs uh, certain um, motifs so that the genotype to phenotype can be uh, linked so uh, i need not have to uh, show this uh, uh, slide because as biologists you are all aware that uh, you know the central dogma of biology is essentially linking genotype to phenotype 
through, uh, you know, you have transcriptome, proteome, metabolome, and uh, phenotype. So you have uh, a phenotype which gets hierarchically linked to the genome. Obviously, the presence of genome does not ensure that you have a phenotype because it requires this linking of uh, uh, hierarchical linking right from the genotype to the phenotype. So I give this example to uh, students where uh, you have a firefly uh, which shows a phenotype that it uh, glows in the uh, night, right? So obviously a biological reaction is taking place. So you need uh, ATP for that reaction to take place so that you can have this firefly glowing. And then for that thermodynamically, this reaction does not ha happen uh, spontaneously. So you need an, a catalyst. Uh, so obviously you need an enzyme, which is the luciferase enzyme. And then you need to code this so that it goes to the next generation. So you have a luciferase gene. So you have a gene which gets decoded and then through the RNA, you have the transcription and translation. You have protein, you carry out a metabolic reaction. Then you show a phenotype. So in 1983, this link was transferred to a tobacco plant and they ensured that uh, the reaction takes place in the tobacco plant. They ensured that the luciferase enzyme is stable. They ensured that the RNA is stable and then they incorporated the gene. And behold, you know, you have this uh, tobacco plant also glowing. So essentially you have linked the genotype to the phenotype of, you know, in some other system. So this was the transgenic plant, which was achieved in 1983. Uh, there was no, systems biology approach, no engineering principle approach, no quantification. This was purely done by trial and error that, you know, you try different things and then uh, the whole link of genotype to phenotype was transferred to a transgenic uh, plant. And then you gave that phenotype to a new system, right? And this is how genetic engineering and all that uh, came about uh, where, you know, you can, you can start playing with the genes. So historically, if you look at it, biology has been a descriptional science. And what has molecular biology done in the last four decades as is given a molecular level description of this hierarchical state. So what this has resulted in is you have genetic signaling and metabolic networks. So there are a lot of connections of the components that are present inside uh, a cell or a living system. So there's several components and these components are all uh, linked through you know, thousands of thousands of components which are present inside, which giving rise to networks. And what has bioinformatics done is that it has added uh, more information to this approach, uh, essentially resulting in a highly interconnected network. So we have the components and then we know how they are getting uh, linked. So uh, what, what this has resulted is in a, high, a interconnected network. And is this information enough? to link the genotype to the phenotype. So that's a question one can ask. So if I know all the components and all the interaction, is this good enough to describe the genotype to the phenotype? It turns out that it is not. So I'll take one step back uh, and I'll talk to you about, uh, you know, uh, as an engineer, what is an engineered system? Okay, so these are man-made systems. Uh, so engineering systems, we, we have quantified to the level that we can uh, design it we can optimize it and we can optimally operate, right? So now we have the capacity to even, uh, you know, send to exactly a location on the moon and land, uh, you know, our satellite. We can send it to Mars. So, you know, how, how are we able to do this? This is also a system which is operating. So we have designed it in such a way that the physics is understood and all the quantification, all the components, everything is understood. The gravity that it has to escape, we understand. Right? So now we have designed the system because we understand everything of each of the component. Why a component is present, we know because we have designed it. So essentially, these systems which we design are very well quantified. And we understand the role of each component that is present. And that is the reason why we can design it, we can optimize it, and we can optimally operate. With omics, biology is also evolving to be a quantitative science. In one uh, level, you know, we can get a lot of information now, unlike uh, a decade or two decades back. Right? So now is the right time where we can apply principles of system science, which is in the engineered system, we have a lot of principles as to how to design, how to optimize. So these things we can apply to biology. Okay? So this is the field of systems biology. So this is driven by both 
uh, experimentation and also a lot of theoretical analysis right so just the way when we design a car or when we design a computer or we design a satellite okay so there are components and we know what is the rating of each component so each component has a certain capacity to operate so we, we bring all these components together and then we say okay does this show a property does it show a characteristic so we we try to do the same thing and then try to see what is the inherent design that is present inside these systems so that we can try to link this genotype to phenotype and understand how evolution has designed certain aspects to give rise to a particular phenotype so that is the goal of systems biology that is you are trying to see the design principle that is present inside a system inside a living system so as engineers what do we do so as engineers you know we design something okay we operate it and then we say okay this is not working we redesign it and then once it is operational we want to control it in the in those operational conditions we want to control it and then we see is there any faults if there are faults then we redesign and we evolve and so this is how a, a engineering uh, you know when humans design so this is the path it takes right you have a design you operate you control you find out faults you redesign it and you evolve okay biological systems also go through a similar set of processes so you have a particular design and then it operates and you have environmental perturbation so now it has to adapt to those environmental perturbations if it is not able to do that then it can it will become extinct so it means that it has to redesign something so it selects there are selections the design gets selected and now you are able to control it properly so then you have a stable system so then under those environmental conditions you can now survive right so this is a evolutionary principle where designs evolve so in terms of perturbations of the uh, natural systems the perturbations that are coming in and th that is how you have a now a genotype to phenotype when we try to understand a system which is evolved and surviving uh, you know in, in current time so now we want to understand how one is to understand this process itself which is very uh, interesting uh, and the other is the current system which is present how does it operate okay how are the components coming together and then giving out a property a, a unique property right so so these type of questions we can ask not just by the network description so what molecular biology did or bioinformatics does is it compares and then it gives a network it looks at all the components that are present and it tries to say that you know these components interact in a particular fashion but uh you know you need far more information uh, to actually try to link the genotype to the phenotype so i give this example so this is a human system uh, a system which is designed by humans so this is a modern aircraft right so it's very complex so you have about 1250 computers there are hundreds of feedback loops okay there are millions of components that are present inside the system and we know that there is a design manual available right so for example the right brothers you know a close you know in the 1920s is when they started designing the uh, aircraft so you, you can see the design has completely changed it has evolved so there is one design which the right brothers attempted and if you look at the current design of the aircraft it is completely different right the system has evolved so more components have been added there are more stability into the system right and uh, so is one of the safest mode of travel now uh, because you know everything is automated we understand the physics of it so you can you know that each time a component has been put by humans you know that the design manual uh, is is available for this because we have designed we know why we have placed a component and so the design manual is available so it's pretty much now you know it only uh, you know the take off requires manual effort pretty much you know the the the, the system is self operating okay almost self operating is it's like an autonomous uh, system uh, that is present so why it is possible because there are 1250 computers and then there are a lot of calculations that are going on there are sensors on, on this uh, aircraft where continuous measurements are being taken okay and all this physics which is understood calculates you know how how it has to be kept stable so the the pilot comes to know when there is turbulence he avoids the turbulence right he can announce and say that you know the turbulence become now so you fasten your belt right so all this information you are you are getting because you understand how the system operates and uh, that's why only take off requires manual effort now for example you take biological system okay have we because we have not designed it it is already present okay? so these systems are bottom up design because humans have created it this is a bottom up design so we have brought components together 
to show a particular characteristic or a particular phenotype. So the phenotype of the flight is that it has to stably fly, it has to take off, be stable on the air, and it has to land. That's its phenotype. So we have brought this design to achieve this particular uh, phenotype. So, but this is a bottom-up design because we have created, we know why the components are present. We have the design manual. So we, we know how the system operates. But if you look at even a simple uh, bacteria uh, like E. coli, which is very well understood. Okay, so this is a design in nature. So this is a top-down approach. This system already exists in nature. Okay, so we have not built it. So I don't know why these components are present. Right? So molecular biology has given most of these components, but we don't know, you know why, what are the properties and what is the phenotype that this is capable of. Right? So we know that it has about 4,400 genes. Now we know a lot of connectivity between genes, mRNA, proteins, and metabolites. So we understand you know, how metabolism takes place. You have TCA cycle, you have glycolytic pathway. right? So, so all, all this, uh, you know, we understand how the amino acids are synthesized. There is transcription and translation that gets tightly regulated, there are global transcription factors, there are signals which go in, right? So we know all this connectivity between genes, mRNA, proteins, and metabolites. So I told you that, uh, you know, um, the uh, aer aeroplane has, has hundreds of feedback loops. Uh, you look at uh, E. coli, simple E. coli. So the order of magnitude is thousands of feedback loops. So a simple bacteria is more complex than the modern aircraft, okay? Just in terms of the complexity, that this feedback gives you, okay? So now I want to understand why these feedbacks are present. You know, why, why is it a, a, a protein which is synthesized is coming back and controlling a gene expression and it is controlling the signaling. So obviously this is a top down approach. That is, it is already present in nature. So there's no design principle available, right? So there's no manual for E. coli. So we have to build a manual. I mean, so we don't know why, uh, what is the manual for this E. coli? Right? And it appears that E. coli does not do any computation, right? So it does not have computers. You had, you looked, uh, you saw in the aircraft, it has 1250 computers, which is fitted. And each moment it is doing a lot of bits of calculations that, that it's doing to, you know, keep the aircraft stable. You assume that the E. coli, uh, you know, is, 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 uh, does not do computation because it does not have computers. But obviously each of these interactions uh, and each of the, uh, uh, reactions that are taking place inside is telling, uh, make help, helping the E. coli decide something, the system decides something. So there's a lot of competition that is going on. And this is what has to be captured. Okay. So the principle of, uh, or, or the basic uh, premise of systems biology is, can I determine the design principles that are available? Okay. Why, why are these components arranged the way it is in the evolution? What are the key comp computational or design principles that exist that it is able to show this input output correlation? Right? So this becomes highly quantitative. Right? So I need to know what is the amount of protein present. I want to know what is the rate at which reactions are taking place. I want to know what is the rate at which a transcription factor is binding to the DNA. So it becomes highly quantitative and it becomes mathematical, just like engineering is a lot of math in terms of designing. So even here, you know, we need to apply all those principles to un understand what is this uh, factor which controls. I'll give you an example, which we have, we have also done some work on that. Is you might have heard of, uh, you know, chemotaxis, right? So E. coli moves from a lower concentration of glucose to higher concentration of glucose. Okay. So this is chemotaxis. So that means that it should be able to uh, sense glucose and find out that it has to move in the direction of higher glucose amount because it is searching for food. So how does E. coli do, do this? So it is a purely engineering problem, correct? I can now design a system which senses a particular concentration and move towards it, right? So you need motor, you need sensing of the element. A signal should go from the uh, sensor to the motor. The motor direction has to be changed, has to be fixed, correct? And each has a components which have to be precisely quantified, okay? The time constant, the rate at which the signal has to go, the rate at which the motor has to move, Right? So how, how, how this whole thing is orchestrated as a system, okay? E. coli does it. Okay, just like an engineer, E. coli is able to sense glucose at one point, remember the concentration, go to another point, measure again what is the glucose, take the difference between the old glucose and compare the two glucose and say that this glucose concentration is higher than the previous glucose concentration. 
right? So I have to move in this direction, send, send that signal to the motor, okay? And then move towards that particular direction. So e, e. coli does this, you know, just autonomously without even, you know, no computers, no calculation, no design. It has evolved, right? So it has evolved to do this because it, it has offered an advantage in the evolutionary process. It has uh, conserved proteins. It has built a sensor, right, to measure, uh, sense glucose. As soon as you put nickel, right, it exactly does the opposite. Nickel is a toxic. So it, send, it sends a signal to the um, motor that you have to move in the opposite direction, okay? So you should not move in the in that direction, but you have to move in the opposite direction, right? So there are precise designs that are available inside E. coli, the signaling pathway and the genetic uh, regulation and how there's a GY protein which goes and binds to the motor. It decides, you know, anti-clockwise or clockwise, the flagellas have to move. So there's a so this is completely understood. So now we know that how E. coli is carrying out this. So just the components will not work, right? So you need to rate these each component. What is the protein concentration? What is the time constant that it takes for the signal to go from one point to the other? So all this decides, you know, how it is able to show a particular phenotype. Okay? So that is the essence of uh, systems biology that we want to uh, characterize the design that is present in living systems by taking the components, doing some experiments to find out some of these time constants, build a model around it, and then show the design that this is how uh, this uh, system, biological system is showing a particular property. Okay. So it turns out that the number of components also you saw that, uh, you know, the aircraft has hundreds of components. And so, whereas these are, I'm sorry, billions of components, even a bacteria has, you know, many components that are present. So these are what are called as complex system. Okay. So complex systems, just the input, you cannot say linearly that, you know, a particular phenotype will be observed. Um, so the com complex systems are uh, systems which, you know, go to a particular steady state given the input. So I give this example to students to make them understand uh, what is what is complexity. Okay. So I will do an experiment. For example, you know, I will take a blue ball and a red ball. Now I will randomly pick a ball. Okay. So what is the probability that it is a uh, blue ball? Right. The probability is 50. Right. So in first shot, you say that there are two balls. So each ball picking up is 50. I'll slightly change the experiment. Okay, what I will do is I will uh, randomly pick a ball and if I find that it is a blue ball, I'm going to add another blue ball in, to the, in the next step. Okay. So for example, if I pick a blue ball in the first step, then in the next set, I'm going to uh, put a two balls. So if I go on doing like this 50,000 steps, so I'll have 50,000 and two balls, right? Because I've carried out 50,000 steps. Now, if I ask, what is the probability? Okay, so I've changed the experiment, you know, instead of making it, you know, exclusive that each time I just have two balls and then I pick a ball and then say, what is the probability that it is blue? That we precisely know, right? It is 50%. So if I do 50,000 times, I expect 25,000 times blue, 25,000 times red. Okay, if there is no bias. So I will, I will get 50-50, okay? But I'm changing the experiment. I'm saying that for each step, I go on adding a new ball. Then what is the probability? Okay. So this I have introduced a nonlinear step now. So as soon as I introduce a nonlinear step, I don't know where, what will be the probability. Supposing I take a blue ball and then it's, I pick a blue ball. Again, I pick a blue ball. I go on picking a blue ball, right? After 50,000 steps, I'll have 50,001 blue ball and one red ball. So the probability that it is blue ball is almost 100%. Okay. So it's a very high chance that you'll pick uh, a blue ball. But by chance, I could have picked red ball. So I go on picking red ball, right? So then the probability becomes it is red ball. So we cannot say what is an outcome. So in a complex system, I cannot say what is the outcome that I'm going to reach just by the system, just by the description of the system. I cannot say what is the output that I'm going to go, right? So I start with 50-50 probability, but I can go to one, I can go to zero. If supposing I have alternated, once I step, I took blue, another red, blue, red, blue, red. So then I will remain at 50. I can go to any probability, okay. but what is it dependent on? It is dependent on what is the path that I take. Okay, the initial condition, uh, what is what is the initial few steps, you know, biases it towards a particular steady state. Okay. The system is the same. Okay, I've not altered the system, but the way it is operated, I have introduced non-linearity into the system. Okay. So complex systems, you know, we introduce each interaction, each feedback introduces a non-linearity, and that introduces a perturbation. 
So that can go to many steady states. Okay. So the definition of complexity is that it goes to multiple outcomes. It can go to multiple outcomes, but the outcome is dependent on what is the history, what is the initial few steps that you take. Okay. So that is what. So if I take this path, I will land up here. If I take this path, I will land up here. Right. So I need to know the history, and I also need to know, you know, where, uh, uh, you know, the the to to tell which outcome that I am going to reach. For example, we are all Indians, right? You know, our forefathers and all that for thousands of years they have stayed here. So genetically, we are very very close. So the variation between us as a system, we all start as a single cell, right? So the variability of each one of us is almost zero point zero zero one percent difference, right? So in the embryo, we are all the same. right so we are not at all different right we start as a single cell with minimal changes that we carry out the snips that we carry out from our parents okay so that's what is the variations that we will have but as we grow right the genomic effects the epigenetic factors the environmental factors all you know perturbs the system this is a complex system it perturbs so we it, go, it can go to any steady state so each one of us are different right so first the gender differentiation then you have so you know uh, multiple differentiations that comes so that small 0.001% change and the complexity okay can evolve you know uh, make us give rise to the diversity that we see okay although the system is the same right so the definition of the system is the same but it can go to multiple steady state okay it can go to many. so there could be a perturbation somebody gets hit by polio virus right and there are two twins one one twin gets polio virus that's it his phenotype changes right he's, he's got a perturbation at that point and then the whole system has uh, gone to a new steady state okay it has gone to a new state so now there is a difference between the two individuals although everything else may be the same right so systems biology tries to capture the essence of complexity to define how a system goes to a particular steady state right and this becomes a crucial fact of understanding how biological systems evolve how biological systems operate and this will also help us to uh, you know play around and then come up with engineering applications and being an engineer for example i want to produce uh, vitamin d right using a bug okay how can i optimize this bug to produce vitamin d right so now i can start asking this question because i know how the genotype phenotype is linked i can go and start manipulating it okay so this is another benefit this is where synthetic biology you know applications of living systems into you know uh, to a particular uh, end result so now we can manipulate it better because we have understood uh, the system better okay so this is the goal of uh, uh, systems biology so obviously you know the properties of uh, complexity you can derive similar to all the biological systems as i indicated it has, it goes to multiple steady state okay it depends on history okay so what is the path that we have taken parametric sensitivity so there are each one of us you know there is a rate at which a reaction happens for example fat accumulation right triglyceride metabo metabolism in liver so each one of us go to a different state so we have different rates so some people are able to digest fat better some people are not able to digest fat better because of their own um, uh, you know genetic epigenetic and uh, you know environmental exposure you know or any state that they have reached so that is why the parametric behaves in a in a different way so there is something called as the bifurcation you know at any given point it can bifurcate into two uh, two species even because of the perturbation right systems are also robust so this is counter to bifurcation then uh, it can be sensitive and it can split but it can also be robust so if we were all to be sensitive to uh, you know pollution uh, you know we will all end up with uh, you know in a really bad state but we are robust our system is able to adapt to perturbations that are occurring so there are designs to take care of this this robustness we also adapt right so we, we can adapt to uh, you know some stimulus and then we also evolve so when everything fails then a new design has to come right so we will have to evolve with, with a new design or, or a new parametric set so all this is possible because of the complexity without complexity if it is a linear system this is not possible so what is a linear system so you might have all done experiments in your 10th standard uh, or in your school where you connect a metal uh, to uh, you know uh, to to a, uh, a battery okay so resistance so you apply a voltage and then you measure the current right so you can plot current versus voltage voltage is input current is output and then ohm's law it is linear so this is a linear system 
so i know that if i put so much voltage so much current will come okay so this is a linear system but i am talking about non linear systems where you know systems don't behave in this linear fashion each interaction is highly non linear in biological systems which give rise to this complexity so you want to understand how genotype is linked to a particular phenotype then you have to capture this complexity which is present you need to mathematically relate how each components are interacting and how a property emerges because of this um, uh, you know so you can not even imagine the kind of properties that emerge because of the interaction of so these complex uh, uh, components that are present okay. so so here is where uh, you know uh, uh, so many many students come and parents also ask me oh you know 11th 12th my son has decided that he has to go to engineering uh, so should he run uh, should he learn biology okay so i tell them that you know if you don't learn biology you are you are missing uh, you know whole lifetime of uh, excitement uh, because now is the time when a lot of uh, computer science principle engineering principles and all can be applied to biological systems and it is just a open field there are so many things that can be done right so it is just like physics and chemistry which was before uh, world war uh, you know the, the the principles that were deciphered at that point is what has given us mobile you know this communication this computers and all that have come because before second world war you know um, all, all the scientists who got were well known uh, right einstein and others so th because of their contributions now you know we have computers we have mobile right so similarly you know biological uh, systems now with easy measurements and all this complexity which are present is is at the throne that you know you, you can do many uh, exciting stuff that is possible so i tell them you know <laughs> don't miss out on the biology aspect of it you know uh, because there's a lot of challenges where many of these engineering principles itself can be applied okay so what are we dealing with we are dealing with non linear dynamics multiple feedback loops multiple interaction cascade structures feed forward loops you know interaction between modules and time scale separation right so one module is at one state another module is at one state and these two are talking about okay so there are something which are happening in seconds something which are happening in hours and there's something happening in decades right so there is a flower which blooms in kerala um in in, in the mountains right um in, in kerala once in 12 uh, 12 years okay so the error is plus or minus you can take 10 to you know 2 weeks maximum that's the error okay if if i mean the global uh, warming is disturbing these things but you know otherwise you know it is just about so how is this plant able to keep track of time that you know in 12 years in the spring time on you know when the tide uh, tide uh, you know it's also linked to the tidal so that it has to bloom okay how how does the system know this okay so this is what systems biology is trying to answer that there has to be a clock right which keeps time otherwise how will it know that it is at one that cycle right so there has to be a design inside the system which keep tracks of all this so this time scale separation interaction between modules sending information you know feed forward sending information backwards so all this what you know engineers use to design are already present and optimizing the evolution so all these designs are already you know they exist so but what this results in is a complex system and this is what we are trying to try to build a manual for this biological systems in the current state a lot of challenges uh, you know by, by you know when when we start quantifying this this uh, you know biological systems first is you know simple motives right you see unlike physics and chemistry i can say that you know it is very generalized physics wants to look at generalized principles okay so in biology you know how can you generalize each system is unique the phenotypes are different the way the genome is different the way they are interacting so how can how can i bring general principles into biology right so so this is very very challenging so there are people who just work on a single uh, node okay inside the biological system for their whole life so there are biologists who just work on uh, you know phosphorylation cycle okay More, you know map can can is cascade so just map cake cascade they have given their whole life you know understanding this well but uh, knock off or express so things things of those kinds right so how can you generalize you know what a uh, you know so this now it is turning out that we have to characterize motives 
you know so there are uh, you know a activating b for example a feeding back on itself so you can come up with lot of motives right so this itself uh, because of the uh, diversity in evolution so you've got so many components in different ways that they can interact and then give give rise to various motives what is the output so this is the system system description there are inputs which perturb this and then you look at outputs so there is a sensitive response there is amplification of signal you have bistability right you have oscillations you have adaptive systems you have homeostasis so all this what is biological systems are showing in in their phenotypic characteristic okay so when i say that a plant is uh, showing you know after 12 years it blooms correct right? so there is a cycle right a 12 year cycle that that the design is able to set okay so uh, if you want to remove noise right so there is a bistable response so biological systems you know give rise to this i'll give an example later so you can see that you know you have so many outputs biological system show for a particular and this these becomes crucial for a particular phenotype and now i can go back and correlate each of these output to a particular motif or multiple of motifs to give rise to a particular type of output given a input right so engineers talk about input output correlation so as soon as they you you go to electrical engineer and he has a circuit so he wants to know you know what are the inputs to the system what are the outputs to the system right so we are also asking similar question right so i have a cell which is a system and i know how supposing i know everything about the system how the components work what is the input to the system right it could be temperature variation it could be glucose gradient like chemotaxis you know what is the glucose concentration so that could be the input so what is the input to the system and what is the output and how it is achieving this right so this is what we are trying to look at through biochemical network structure and dynamics okay the structure becomes important the topology of the network becomes important and how the dynamics operate okay so so that also becomes uh, very important so we need to correlate this to understand genotype to phenotype uh, you know uh, linkages so i can look at a simple component you know simple network for example a activates b b activates c and c inhibits this right so just by this motive by changing the uh, you know the relevance of each of these components i can get a adaptive response a homeostatic response oscillation robust bistable right so all this can be got by just changing some of these components i can i can change networks and i can i can come up with many of these uh, you know output responses to a, to a given uh, set of inputs okay so what is the first step right? the first step is why did systems biology not come say 3 decades back or uh, you know 5 uh, 5 decades back right so because we had to understand the we had to understand the components okay first we have to understand what the components are present and how i am bringing these components together so systems biology cannot escape the knowledge that the molecular biology and the structural biology which have brought brought about okay so now i am trying to bring all this thing together right so those approaches are what are called as reductionist approach so i don't know anything about the system it is right so it's like a puzzle for me so i break open the cell i try to see which molecules are there what is the genome you know how the mrna is happening what is the ribosomal capacity how these things are happening so i understand by breaking open just like a, you know the child breaks the toy and wants to know what are the present you know what are the things that are present so we are trying to be reduction this is what is called as a reductionist approach where we break broke open and then try to see all the components that are uh, present okay so uh, yeah uh, so 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 this is what is uh, a reductionist approach where we try to bring all these components uh, together uh so the the current systems biology requires an integrative approach because i want to look at the system as a whole not just you know a transcription factor is binding to a dna right so this transcription fa factor binding to a dna can have a serious effect because of the complexity in terms of the phenotype okay so that's what i want to understand so we look at an integrative approach so what do we do we look at components we reconstruct it so we do a lot of modeling and simulation we do feedback analysis and then try to see you know what is the design what is the design that is present right so this is what we try to do so the first step is i have to reconstruct okay the system so uh, the component wise i have to build uh, the system and then i have to reconstruct it okay so once i have reconstructed it that is when you know i can look at uh, mathematical modeling you know bring in all the data the genomics protein all the omics data i can bring it together and then look at it in a mechanistic way how these components are coming together and how the input output is getting analyzed right so that 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 is the approach that 
uh, you know the systems biologists take so they go along with experiments and a uh, lot of mathematical analysis to integrate and then try to understand how the input output are correlated okay so i will start and give you some few examples obviously i will not go into the mathematics of it or how it is said i'll just try to highlight you know what are the kind of information we extract and what is the understanding that we get of a particular system so just let me take a genetic network and we have been doing some work on how yeast metabolizes galactose okay so when glucose and galactose is given how yeast takes up galactose right so this is a uh, system which uh, consumes the galactose and then multiplies so we want to look at you know what are what are the uh, how how yeast is able to do this so we have to look at what are the mechanisms that are prevalent so obviously we know there will be some protein dna interaction but as soon as you say genetic network right there are transcriptional cap factors which will come and bind to the dna so there is a protein dna interaction you will have protein protein interaction right you will have stoichiometry so you can have multiple binding sites for a particular protein or the protein can dimerize okay you have auto regulation that means that a gene will uh, you know regulate itself okay it can auto regulate and then because it is uh, yeast there is a nucleus things can go from cytoplasm to nucleus nucleus to cytoplasm and to other organelles right so there is a shuttling okay which also can be tightly regulated right so all this decides you know how a genetic network you know what is the state the steady state that it will go to okay so this is the network so this is the glucose galactose regulon and yeast okay so this is a inducible system that means that we need to have gal galactose to be present before the system uh, you know uh, responds so you look at this complexity just to decide whether the galactose has to be taken in so many components are present okay in yeast uh, you have certain interactions taking place in uh, cytoplasm there are some that are taking place in nucleus and then you have a transport okay across the membrane okay, some components which are transporting right so as soon as you put galactose there is a protein called g3 which gets activated and it takes the inhibitor away so this g8 is a inhibitor okay It, it takes away, okay. And now G A T cannot enter the uh, nucleus, and because this G A T cannot enter, the G A T uh, you know starts going back. Whatever G A T is there, it will start coming back to uh, cytoplasm. And then this is the transcriptional activator, Gal four, so which comes and binds and then releases, and then all the genes are activated. Okay, so this is the system which is used to uh, switch on the uh, glucose galactose uh, network. Okay. Now, supposing I want to uh, phenotyp uh, phenotypically uh, link to the complete genome and the perturbation. So, what is the external perturbation? Galactose concentration. How much of galactose is present? As soon as glucose is there, the whole thing shuts. The Gal4 itself gets inhibited, and then nothing is synthesized. Okay. So, you do you should not have glucose, but when you put galactose, these are the interactions that are taking place. Okay. So now, all these values that I have put here, you know, these are the binding constants. K two, K four, this K, K two. So these are the system parameters. Okay, they are very, very essential. So I need to know what are the system parameters because I change this K two, it will behave completely different. I change this K three, it will completely, you know, behave differently. So this is like rating the um, uh, electric circuit, right? So you say you rate the electric circuit means they'll say, okay, this has a capacitor and the rating is ten ohms. Right, fifty ohms capacitor. So each one is rated. Similarly, each interaction has to be rated, and this is very crucial for the design. Okay, the input output will not work if these things, these values change. Okay, so we uh, look at all this and then try to bring in the input output. Right. So this is the experimental input output, and then our model can tell you, you know, precisely how it lies on that, how the system is behaving, how sensitive it is in terms of the galactose concentration, how the growth rate is linked. Because of this uptake rates that the galactose has, now I can start understanding, you know, each, each behavior of how yeast is, uh, you know, uh, taking up galactose and then looking at the network, and then later by linking it to the metabolism, I can look at. It. So you can see here that there are some uh, which are uh, so this G3 does not interact with the gene at all. Okay, so it is just a protein-protein interaction which which happens, right? So these are only one binding site, right? So there are two. G, uh, there are genes which have two binding sites for a transcriptional factor, or there is only one binding site. So this matters a lot. So if I make all this as you know single binding, correct, then the system will not work. 
Okay, so even the number of binding site on a gene becomes crucial to show a particular phenotype. Right, so that we can now demonstrate because that is crucial to the design of how the system operates, how you know a sensitive uh, system operates. So we can actually uh, demonstrate through experiments also. Right, so this is what is systems biology. Now I've actually built you know the interactive map. I've built what are the interactions which are crucial. It turns out that this transport. Right, the nucleocytoplasmic transport of this inhibitor GAT going in and out into the cytoplasmic membrane is the key design factor. Right, so you put you put an inhibitor, that's it. The system can be uh, stopped completely. Okay, so so we, we know exactly how this uh, system operates. Right, we can do dynamic analysis. So why is this complexity? I could have had just the GAL4 binding and coming out. Right, but it has given so many interactions. Right, so it turns out that if there is a perturbation in the galactose. Or even there is a perturbation in any of those parameters, right? So the noise is minimum. So the whole control, the structure is able to handle. So even one interaction, okay. So for example, they're all dimerizing. If you look at it, so they, they form a dimer, right? So G80 is becoming dimer, right? If supposing I say, no, 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 I don't need dimer. I'll just want monomer is good enough, right? So I say that only monomer is good enough. Everything is interacting only as a monomer. If I do that and design, right? So this is what I'm going to get huge noise. The blue line is that. Right, you see the huge noise which is there. Right? The system is behaving in absolute noisy way, whereas the real system is a black one. Once it is decided that it has to be on, right, whatever may be the perturbation, right, it, it, it is minimal noise. So it has attenuated all the noise completely. Those feedbacks, the dimerization, you know, all is helping the system to reduce the noise. You know, to, to take care of the noise. So it has evolved. Galact whenever galactose is present, yeast knows that it is very important. To take that carbon for its own survival, right? It has evolved this network so that noise goes away and it's able to respond very sensitive in terms of the galactose that is present in the medium, right? So we can look at such control structure analysis and then relate it to the uh, network and the quantification, how actually it is designed. So now it is like building a manual for how yeast, you know, the phenotype of yeast growing on galactose, how it actually works. So now I can map it out you know, completely. So that's what I was telling in terms of. So what is the other thing? The same noise. I can look at the number of protein mRNA count and then do the experiments uh, and, and then show that. Look at this. You know, if if I if, if I don't have these feedbacks, right? It is so noisy. Okay. If I put these negative feedbacks of Gal eighty and Gal three, you see it is so tightly bound. So you know it is able to handle the noise. So at molecular level, I can actually do experiments and show that even if one of the feedbacks or dimerization, if you remove, now I can go and mutate at the protein level and not make them bind, uh, you know, make them monomers. I can immediately see that, you know, it becomes highly noisy. So you look at the mRNA count, you know, you can have mRNA count varying from, uh, you know, only uh, 800 to you know, 5,000. Whereas if I have regulation, it is tightly bound, right? So this tight bounding is coming because of the structure, the way it has been designed, right? It's able to handle noise, it's able to respond sensitive to galactose, it's able to optimize its growth on galactose. So all this is happening because there is a network of that kind. So I'm correlating this. Okay, so this is what is the crux of uh, systems biology. Right? So this is another example that we have worked on. So this is uh, tryptophan regulation in E. coli. Okay, so uh, when you have, uh, if you give uh, tryptophan in the medium, uh, uh, the E. coli does not have to produce. Right? That's a waste of energy. Okay, so there is a cost associated in producing uh, tryptophan by using the nitrogen source. But if I give tryptophan externally. Why should the cell produce, right? So it has got a network, okay? So it says that T external will go bind to the, just like the lacoperon that you might know, right? It's just like the lacoperon is used to produce the lactose. So your tryptophan goes and binds to two sites, goes and binds and then shuts off the synthesis, right? And then if the external is not there, then it will say that, you know, this tryptophan will be free and then you'll have the uh, mRNA to be produced, enzyme to be produced, the nitrogen source will get converted to tryptophan. Okay, so uh, so we can analyze now. Actually, what is the rate at which this is enzyme is getting synthesized? What is the rate at which nitrogen is getting uh, converted to tryptophan? What are the binding constants? How do you, how does it bind? So now I'm understanding this as a complete, not just description. Okay, not just as a description that tryptophan comes and comes and binds here and it, it shuts off and that is why you know this is not happening. I, I actually want to know what is the design principle, right? What are the quantification? You know, what if why, why is it that there are two binding sites for tryptophan? Why the repressor has two binding sites, two sites at which tryptophan can bind, 
right? So how, how sensitive is this KD? If a part of this KD does the phenotype show up? Okay. So these kinds of questions that we can start asking. And it turns out that there are three negative feedbacks, right? So this is a completely like an engineer looking at the system because you have three processes, okay? And these three processes are getting controlled by what tryptophan, okay, that is present. So you have transcription, you have translation, and the tryptophan synthesis. So the genotype, the mRNA going to the protein and the uh, enzymatic reaction of producing tryptophan, okay? So the tryptophan uh, enzyme inhibition, it, it inhibits this, it attenuates at the mRNA level, it has a transcriptional regulation, right? So I can now quantify, why three inhibition? Okay, I could have had only one inhibition or two inhibitions. So why do you have these three inhibitions, right? So it becomes very, very crucial. So there are fundamental questions, are multiple feedback loops and interaction redundant? And a overclean. Okay. Is this that it is redundancy that it is taken care of, or these designs are very essential okay, for, for uh, you know the operation of the system? Okay. So we can ask the why of the system and how of the system, you know, we can start asking now. Right? So we can actually see that if I had only one feedback, this is the dotted line, right? So it takes about one hour to produce the tryptophan. The organism dies in 10 minutes. Okay, if tryptophan is not there for 10 minutes, the organism dies. So the response has to be that in 10 minutes, it has to produce, uh, you know, the right amount. Okay. So you look at the, uh, the dotted line. So this is the normal equalizer. This is how it behaves. Okay. So in 10 minutes, it produces the what is required. So steady state is about four micromole inside the cell. You need that much tryptophan. So it just produces you know, in just 10 minutes. So those feedbacks are very, very essential. So you need those feedbacks to actually show the phenotype, otherwise it's, it's going to die. I could have had one feedback, adjusted the parameter, and then uh, you know made it come in 10 minutes. But then this six would have been 600. Okay, that's not an optimal response. Right? So by having three feedback, negative feedback, right? It is, but it rate has to be very high. Okay, because it has to very quickly synthesize. But if it very quickly synthesize, it will produce far more. Right? And then what is needed? So then it has to be controlled. So it, is, it has evolved three negative feedbacks so that precisely it can evolve to a state where it is optimal for the system. Okay. So that is how three feedbacks play a role in just the tryptophan regulation. And we know how each have to be quantified. Right. And the strength also we know. So this is the strongest, the next strongest, and this is the weakest. Okay. So even when suddenly it comes in, uh, in the presence of tryptophan, it can switch off using this uh, inhibitor. So you cannot imagine the level of optimization this system has done okay, for each of its phenotype. And that is why this complexity is there. Right? It has to first, as soon as it sees glucose uh, gradient, it should start moving towards glucose. And that system has to be optimized. Suddenly it sees that tryptophan is not there. Okay, Glucose might be there, tryptophan is not there. Right? It has to now respond differently. So multiple, feedback, uh, multiple inputs are going and it has to show an optimal phenotype. So and that is where this manual building becomes important. So how can I build a manual to say that under, under these conditions, this is all the system will be under these conditions this is how the system is going to be here. Right. So for that, just the network description is not enough. We need to try to analyze this as a system. Dynamics are important. Steady states are important. Input output correlations are important. So all this come into the picture to answer such questions. Okay. Why is this multiple feedback there? You know, are these inter interactions redundant? Why is this present? Why is, uh, for this phenotype, this uh, network is evolved? Okay, why this multiple feedback is evolved? So these kinds of uh, questions that we can ask. So similarly, uh, you know, in signaling pathways. So this is about how nitrogen and carbon has to be controlled in E. coli. Okay? So initially, I'll give you examples of E. coli because this is very well understood. Okay, so if I take a system which I don't know anything about, okay, so then obviously I cannot do systems biology. So the starting point of asking these questions are when the components are reasonably understood. Okay, so then I can start asking these kinds of questions. So here you have glucose, a carbon produces uh, alpha ketoglutarate, and then you have this glutamine. Okay, glutamine synthetase it produces this glutamine. So you have amino acid, nitrogen, and glucose. So this has to be balanced. Okay, so depending on how much carbon is there and how much nitrogen is there, the cell has to decide how much of this glutamate synthesis has to be active. Okay. Towards this, it has evolved a system. Okay, so one is so it it, it does covalent modification, it does feedback inhibition, it has genetic regulation, right? Where ammonia is converted to ADP, glutamine synthetase, glutamate go to glutamine, and then you have NADPH going to NAD, and you have all this amino acid that's produced, which goes and gives a feedback. 
Okay, so this you have the glutamine synthetase system of E. coli, and then you have a transcriptional uh, network. I'm not going to the details. I want you to take the essence of you know what is the significance of systems biology. So it is a two-component regulatory system. So this again we can model it, and then we can understand what is the response of this two-component regulatory system, and then it is linked to a signaling pathway, right? So the urination takes place. Okay, the water goes to UMP. There's the urination that takes place, right? So there are twelve. Um, in, in this in, in this protein of glutamine synthetase, there are twelve points at which ATP can bind. So why twelve? Right? So we could have done it with two. So we can now start asking why is this? Okay, why do we have this twelve? Uh, and obviously, glutamine and alpha KG controls this. They are the inputs. Okay, they are the broad inputs to the system. The transcriptional uh, regulation also plays a role. The signaling pathway also plays a role. Right? So these are interacted in a Complex way with multiple feedbacks. Just what is what is the decision that the cell is taking? How much of carbon is present? How much of nitrogen is present? And how should I respond? Okay, so that is what the cell is taking to take a decision. Right? For the aeroplane to be kept stable, I had computers. Right? I have a pilot there to take a decision. The computers to take a decision, which gives all the inputs into the system. Right? Calculates physics and then tries to say that keep it stable. Show a particular phenotype. So here the organism is evolved, correct, to certain inputs, and how to that input, what is the response that I need to show? Okay, how should I? What is the decision that I need to take? So it is helping the cell to take a decision, given the carbon and nitrogen signal in the environment. Okay, and it is crucial that you need uh, all this, you know, complexity. Even one of these you knock off, then you know it will not perform as as good as what the wild type would do it. Okay. So we can now look at uh, all these interactions. So you have the deuridination, uridination, adenylation. You know, again, glutamine and two kg decides. And then you have the transcriptional factor, and finally, the net amount of glutamine synthetase. What is the amount of glutamine synthetase that has to be synthesized, and how much should it be active? How much it should be active for the conversion to the amino acid? Uh, you know, how much is the conversion? So both this question, this system is uh, answering. Okay? So we can look at what are the proteins in the in all the com complexity. Right, it responds only to UTAs. Okay, sensitivity. In terms of sensitivity, it responds to only UTAs. And at what point it should respond depends on how much of carbon is present. Okay, two kg. So depending on the two kg, you know, it it will respond in a different way. Okay. So the 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 system is designed to respond to only one protein UTAs and two kg. Why that complexity? Okay. Sorry. Why this complexity? This complexity is just to make it. Not sensitive to any other perturbation, right? So it has to respond only to uh, alpha kg and uh, you know how much of glutamine is, nitrogen is present. So just this, it has to respond. Right? So we look at all this, you know, what is the input output for each uh, uh, component which is present and how they interrelate, how they interact, and then how the finally uh, the enzyme reaction is taking place, right? So the total amount of enzyme and how much is it active. Okay, these two signals map to the input of two kg and glutamine. Okay, so this is like uh, one one uh, you know circuit. So I can put a black box here, you know, and put a circuit. I don't want to know what is there inside. Two kg enters, glutamine enters. These are the signals for carbon and nitrogen. Now, how much of glutamine synthesis has to be produced is an output, and how much it should be active. Okay, that is an output. Right. So all this is essentially to do that. Okay, to take for the cell to take that decision. Okay, so we can look at this. This is the transcriptional factor. You can see it's like a switch. Okay, so this is glutamine concentration and this is different concentration of alpha kg. How much of carbon is present? So depending on car if carbon is present uh, in high amount, it will shift to a larger glutamine concentration to shut off. If it is very low carbon, very low nitrogen, it shuts off very immediately. Okay, it's conserving its uh, energy to survive. Okay, so. And this is the total active GS. Okay, how much of total active GS is present? You can see that the transcriptional factor and the signaling, you know, coincides, right? So it'll it'll be active till here, and then suddenly it will switch off. Uh, if you have a large a lot amount of carbon and at a higher glutamine, it'll go on being active and large amount being produced, and then it will shut off at this point. Okay. So depending on carbon and nitrogen, it is giving a very precise input output decision. I know that is the phenotype that the, the cell is deciding how to. Behave given the carbon and nitrogen input into the system. Right, so this is the kind of information that we uh, extract.
Okay, let me look at the time and then give you example. Uh, I'll just give you one more examples and then probably we can open up for uh, discussion. Uh, okay, so so this is about uh, migration of immune cells, right? So so how does how does immune cell migrate? So uh, right, so there is a GPCR driven signaling network uh, in uh, eukaryotic chemotaxis, and uh, what does it do? It senses a gradient. Okay, it uh, polarizes some signaling molecules inside and polarization for it to move. Okay, so you, you need to control all this, right? You, you need to go through as an engineer. If I if I have to do the same thing, then you, I I love to do this. For example, you have these neutrophils, right? Neutrophils have to be sensed. Sent to the point of infection, or whenever there is a wound, uh, whenever there is a cut in in my skin, a certain neutrophils have to be sent. So how, how do they reach there? Right. So the neutrophil sends one percent difference in the concentration, okay, of the antigens and all that. You know, it is able to move directed towards that. Okay. So how precisely it is able to go to that location where it is there? So it has to be very efficient. Otherwise, you know, it will go and activate at different points, and you don't need that. You want you want it to act at a particular point. So so how how does it? What is the time constant? How quickly is it, you know how is able to respond? So so this we did uh, analysis of this. Uh, I will just briefly tell you. Uh, so experiments were with respect uh, were done with uh, in collaboration with Professor Gautam at Washington uh, University School of Medicine. So what we did was this is the this is how it works. So there is a stimulus uh, GP, through GPCR. It activates a G protein which activates an activator and you have an inhibitor. Okay, so this inhibitor controls how much of PIP3 is in one end. Okay, this inhibitor translocates very quickly and then it inhibits the PIP3. So if the stimulus is here, PIP3 is activated at this end, and PIP3 is not activated uh, in the other cell. So just a particular one cell. Okay, so if you have a neutrophil, it can uh, go from one. Uh, you know, the PIP3 will accumulate at one end, and PIP3 will not accumulate at the other end, and then you will have this uh, transport taking place. Okay, so so we analyze this and then we came up with uh, you know what this inhibitor is and what is the rate at which it has to diffuse. So we did this analysis and uh, you know correlated the complete uh, input output uh, analysis for the system. So so you put a uh, sorry you put a input GPCR activated it activates PIP3 gets activated you know inhibitor is shut off so there's no inhibition the inhibitor goes to the other end back compartment you know it activates the inhibitor and it shuts off the PIP3. So PIP3 is only at one end. PIP3 is not there at the other end. So this drives the actin, uh, you know, uh, process for the cell to move in that direction. So wherever PIP3 accumulates, it will move in that direction, right? So this is the front. The black one is the front, and the red one is back. So if I alternate, if I put input here, I put input here. I take input there. I take the input here. So if I alternate like this, then you know it will give like this. You know, so look, look at that. In uh, in very very small time, you know, it just shuts off. You know, uh, completely shuts off, and then the PIP3 goes to the other end, and it starts moving. Right? So we we did the complete analysis of this in terms of the dynamics. Okay, uh, I'll just show you some movies to demonstrate. You know what systems biology told. You know how it correlates to uh, experiments. Okay, so there are many examples. Uh, you know, I, I will just uh, stop at this point. Show you some of these uh, movies. Uh, let me just come out of this. <clears throat> You're able to hear, right? Hello. You able to hear? No, sir. Yes, sir. We can. Okay. Okay. 
so this is the immune cell and this is uh, the membrane has been activated by a optical sensor right so if i put this sensor here you see how the immune cell moves okay wherever i put that signal you know the 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 cell will start moving towards that right and that whole dynamics is driven by the network that i showed okay and you can also show how the pip3 plays a role right so this is pip3 is uh, you know greenly labeled so you see pip3 is in very high concentration at one end and uh, pip3 is uh, you know see for example you know you put here all the pip3 accumulates and it starts moving okay sir, you have i reverse that pip3 starts accumulating here and it starts moving here okay me, sir so, yes can you, can you share it sir oh i'm sorry i'm sorry it's not share no sir we can see your ppt oh okay, okay. i'm sorry 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 i know i know what i'm what i'm doing yes, yes, yes. i can see the screen okay okay yeah <laughs> just a minute just a minute you're able to see the player now no not yet okay eh uh, ekdam clear hai kya hua na no, na no, he is showing some movie ha ah, nahi movie nahi dikh raha hai uh, screen hi dikh raha hai na ah, that's what that's what i'll, I'll just uh, just a minute Ah, okay. Now you're able to see. Yeah, right. Yeah. So what I was telling was, uh, so this is the immune cell, uh, which is act. You are not able to see, right? Ah, uh, no. Uh, we can see it now. We can yeah, see yeah. the movie, sir. Right? Yeah, yeah. So this is the immune cell, and then optical activation we have put on the membrane, and then you can see that. Uh, so as soon as the signal is there it starts moving towards it as soon as i give a signal it will start moving towards it okay so we yeah. can actually get the rate at which it is moving you know what is the time response and how that uh, design uh, the the network design which is there okay which plays up okay so similarly this is for uh, you know pip3 pip3 is labeled in green so as soon as you give the signal you see uh, pip3 accumulates there you put the signal here pip3 accumulates here and it starts moving right so look at the response time right so it, it is able to you know in 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 seconds uh, the, the cell is able to uh, take a decision you know which direction that it has to move correct so just knowing the network uh, will not help so we need to actually know how uh, you know how how the network what is the time constant what are the protein concentrations you see here you know the pip pip3 is accumulating at the same there is no pip3 on the other end okay mm. so there's absolutely no pip3 on the other end and you can see how the cell is moving towards you know the the uh, input in input signal yes so uh, how much time do i have can i show something else or this is fine <laughs> Yes, you can. There aren't yet many questions, so yeah. yes, you can go on. Okay, 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 okay. All right, all right. Uh, so, so what what I will do is uh, so we have done something uh, in in uh, human physiology as well, uh, which. Uh, So I'll, I'll quickly tell you some uh, results of that. Uh, so this is where you know my the company that I've started. Okay, so we are trying to uh, similarly model uh, you know the systemic defect uh, or the disease. Okay, so we want to look at effect of lifestyle. You know whether the disease is because of uh, metabolism, is because of signaling, or it's because of uh, the gene or epigenetic or genetic factors. So it could be interaction problem, it could be a communication problem, or it could be a reaction problem. So you can have. uh these kinds of uh, you know perturbation at, uh, at at any level obviously these are far more complex because this is in human system 
right? So, uh, so we, one can do a similar thing. You know, we do a lot of data mining, get all the information from literature. We build a network. We model it, model these networks, and then we link it with uh, experiments. You know, effect of drug, uh, diet. You know, uh, so we use some bioinformatics, and then uh, you know, correlate the, uh, the the experiments. Then link it to the clinical trials, and then we validate. If it doesn't validate, you know, we go and again do see whether something is there. There are open questions, and then we correcting. We keep correcting this. Okay, that's how we build uh, the manual. You may call it, you know, so something like that for the, for a system. Right. So we've done a lot of uh, analysis for the insulin glucagon because diabetes is a big problem. So we have looked at uh, insulin and glucagon signaling and linked it to metabolism. Right. So you can look look at this. This is like a chemical plant. Right. So you know each one interacting. How does it interact? So we build a map of this kind. Right. And uh, we look at the input output. Right. So engineers means you know they want to know what is the input and what is the output. So, so something like this. So I can now do, you know, I breakfast, I took something, so many calories, carbohydrate, protein, fat, lunch, dinner, I did some exercise. Then now I can start looking at how glucose goes up and comes down. Okay, in time. Okay, when I exercise, how gluconeogenesis, you know, increases the glucose. What is it, how insulin and glucagon changes. Okay, the uh, muscle glycogen, what happens, you know, liver glycogen, what happens. So I can start looking at, you know, the human as a system and then dynamically try to map hormones to the metabolism, okay? Because we have models for liver, adipose tissue, muscles, and things like that. And then we have sort of integrated that to get a uh, you know, whole body response of something of this kind, right? So, uh, so this is something, uh, you know, in what is called as an input-output response, something similar to, uh, you know, the voltage and the current that I was telling you, right? So I put a voltage, that is an input, output is current, okay? And uh, I do experiments and then get a uh, line. Okay, linear line that is Ohm's law. The slope of the line will tell me what is the resistance. Okay, here insulin is something like a voltage. Okay, that is the potential. Okay, so potential is insulin has the capacity to do something. So it is a potential. It is just like you know, just like what the uh, your battery does. Okay, gives voltage. So this is also giving something, right? So this is the something equivalent to voltage. So this is the input insulin. This is amount of GLUT4 present on the uh, cell surface. Okay, it may be in muscle, it may be in adipose tissue, it may be in liver, depending on the cell type that I'm taking. Right. So this is the this one is proportional to the rate at which glucose is entering the cell. Okay, muscle cell or liver cell or uh, you know adipose cell. So this is telling me what is the rate at which glucose is going in. This is telling me what is the insulin. This is voltage. This is something like current. Okay. Current is rate at which electron is moving. Here I'm looking at rate at which glucose is going in into the cell. Okay, so this is just the same. Here it is not linear, right? So what you have is a non-linear input-output. Okay, so as soon as glucose goes up in the blood, insulin starts increasing in the blood. Okay, and then once it comes to a particular level, it just switches on completely. Okay, and insulin is about uh, 0.1 nanomole to 0.2 nanomole. So this is the physiological range. So you are you're on. Okay, till the glucose is there. Once glucose goes away, insulin starts getting degraded and it starts decreasing. Okay, it is not coming back at the same point. It goes to another point and then comes down. Okay, so this is what is called as a bistable input-output response. So each time we have a meal, right? Liver cells will be going through this. Okay, muscle cells will be going through this. Right. So there is. So it, it has to take a decision. You know where it has to activate and then keep it stable and then come back and come back to the. So why is this? You know. The switching on it at one point of insulin, concentration of insulin, and killing is at another point of insulin, right? So this is where it is given buffer. Insulin is in nanomoles, you know, the concentration of insulin is very, very small. These are all very expensive. The body cannot produce a huge amount of insulin because it also is a growth factor. It will go and affect many things, many other things, right? So it has to be maintained in a very, in a very fixed concentration. So to do that, it, it produces only this. And so it is highly noisy, okay, because the number of concentration of insulin molecules are very less. And it is it has to pass through blood to different cells, so it's highly noisy. So it will be varying. Okay. So if it were only one point, then you know if the noise is here, the noise will also go to the output. Okay. So this is like a filter. So it is kept a filter. So switch on, it will switch on late, and switch off, it will come back and then switch on at the initial insulin concentration. So so even if there is noise here, you know insulin concentration is varying a lot. It has taken a decision that it has to be on. Okay, so this is like a bistable switch. It, it's like just our electric switch, right? So it's just like that. It just goes on, switches it on completely. 
and then you go and switch off at a you know when insulin comes to a different concentration right so this is how it operates right? okay so there is a molecule called ptpas okay in this network that i was showing so there is somewhere here ptpas is there okay the ptpas goes and puts a feedback okay so so this ptpas what does it do right what does what it does it it shifts the uh, the input output to the right so as soon as ptpas is increased this input output goes to the right okay there is nothing wrong with the insulin there is nothing wrong with the rate at which glucose is going in what has happened the, the culprit is this ptpas okay which is a signaling molecule in the insulin signaling pathway okay so because of this the input output has got shifted okay so you need a higher insulin higher voltage to get the same response that means that it has your your physiological insulin is here okay your physiological insulin is here okay but it is off now it should have been on but now it is off okay so this is what is type 2 diabetic state so there are 23 points which are sensitive in the signaling pathways which can give rise to such type 2 diabetic state okay now in an individual i don't know whether it is because of ptp whether it is because of p10 which molecule is causing i don't know okay so what is the treatment you either control the glucose uptake you know like metformin or you give insulin if you are not able to control by medication they'll say okay pump insulin right because the insulin has become insensitive so insulin is no longer working but the insulin is not the culprit the culprit is the signaling molecule ptps okay so what has happened here is the input output has got disturbed what is the true treatment the true treatment is that you bring this back to original state okay but we don't know you know there are multiple uh, reasons why this can happen so in an individual what is the what is the cause right so 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 uh, that that is a challenge so that is the reason why you know the drugs are all acting on the output or at the input they are not acting at the real culprit okay and obviously you know all this you know long term usage of this medication and insulin you know you know has its own side effects and because it's a growth hormone and keep pushing it right so these these problems will come right so uh, so you can get insights like this as to how the, the insulin uh, you know uh, dynamics operates okay uh, and this is another uh, interesting uh, thing I'll, i'll close with this and then i'll show you some uh, demo so so what this essentially tells you is that this is the fasting glucose you know 5.2 millimole per liter so that is about 80 uh, in the other units you know, it comes down to 80 so this is about 5.2 millimoles so this is where we are okay and it is slightly catabolic because your glycogen has to be broken down to maintain glucose when you are resting okay when you are fasting so this is where the you, your uh, state will be so the y axis is whether your body is catabolic or anabolic okay so catabolic is your uh, you know gluconeogenesis and fat is getting broken down protein is getting broken down so this is the catabolic and anabolic is it is getting synthesized right fat and amino acids are getting synthesized so when you are fasting you are somewhere here okay this is 5.2 millimoles so somewhere here you are okay so morning i get up i exercise so what happens my glucose will drop because i'm exercising muscle requires huge amount of glucose so it just goes in okay so now what will happen glucose will drop okay but glucose cannot drop because then the brain will have less glucose and you will faint so glucose has to be maintained right so that is why you become catabolic okay so you 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 go go up so you you become completely catabolic so you you are in this state okay your glucose uh, inherent glucose is somewhere here and because uh, your glucose has to be maintained the catabolism gives that rates and it is still maintained slightly higher okay slightly higher than 5.2 so when you are exercising it can even come down to 5.6 or even 6 amount of glucose right so so this is the catabolic so after you have exercised right so you have to give you, you, your your body is in the catabolic state huge amount of atp is getting uh, generated for for the exercise that that you, you need to do right and we are not efficient okay so the co2 has to be taken out so your lung capacity and your stamina decides you know how how this catabolism anabolism decision is taken right so you could be uh, you know uh, produce huge amount of atp more than what is needed by you right and that is what gets released as heat so when you over exercise obviously you know you you generate heat and then to cool your body you have evaporative cooling you sweat right so you can correlate all this physiological thing by and how it is dependent on the signaling pathway right the signaling pathway is deciding all this phenotype right whether somebody sweats a lot somebody doesn't sweat a lot 
So all, all this is coming about because you know the way your signaling pathway is operating, right? In, in, in the old way, how your catabolism and anabolism is getting regulated, that decides you know the final phenotype. So you, you can go and look at that. So that's why they say when you after you exercise, your body has to cool down, right? So shavasan, right? So that's what people do, you just lie down. Why, why do you have to just lie down? You are essentially allowing the catabolism to come back to this fasting state. I cannot have start having meals here. Okay. So if I start eating, your body is in the catabolic state and you are now giving a wrong signal. You are saying you become anabolic, right? So you have a resting phase where you come down to this. You know, your body has to come down to this 5.2 millimole and your catabolism, your body should be slightly above anabolic. Okay. So this is 0.5. You have to be around, you know, 0 0.55, 0 0.56. Once you've cooled down, your body's cooled down, then you can have, uh, you know, that is when you have to take bath, you have to have meals, food and all that after that, after your body cools down. Right. So then if, when you have meals, your glucose will increase now. Okay. Then you can, you come to this part. Okay. You come here and then you go back. Right? So, but if you're, you, have, you have a very heavy breakfast, for example, and your glucose goes beyond a certain point, then the cell is dedicated. The, the system is dedicated. It just says, come down, be completely anabolic. Okay. So then uh, your adipose tissue stops working, your muscle stops working, liver is in high mode, producing fats. Okay. So, so, so that, that is what happens, you know, when you come to this branch. Going back, it does not go through this path. It goes through this path. So for a long period of time, Right? You, it, it takes this path and then it comes back to the steady state, okay? In, into the uh, resting state, right? So this dynamics, you know, happens every time you exercise, you, you, you know, you watch TV, you are working, you're having, to, so this is a very dynamic, although I've shown it as a steady state, it's a dynamic response, right? So you exercise, you come back, you have food, somewhere in the middle you have snacks, which may be highly, you know, your glucose goes beyond a certain point and becomes anabolic, you come back, or you go here and come back, right? So this is a, like an operating curve. You know, engineers use for this equipment, what is an operating curve, okay? So for catabolic, anabolic balance, this is the operating curve, right? So we can put a balance in a day, how much were you catabolic, how much were you anabolic, by actually tracking some of this output, input, output, correlating to the input, which are the food that you take, how much carbohydrate, how much fat, how much polysaturated fat. And so in the nutrition, you know, this is what is the So it is giving a perspective or a, uh, engineering perspective to the uh, you know diet nutrition lifestyle right so so those kinds of things you know it gives a perspective how our system operates okay in terms of catabolic and anabolic the problem is if you're able to balance this catabolic and anabolic every day so this imbalance is what creates oxidative stress okay because this metabolism catabolic and anabolic are you know both are uh, oxidatively stressful right both exercising and anabolism if you are there in steady state, right? So somebody is meditating, not doing anything, no perturbation. So you'll just stay here, homeostasis. You'll stay in the middle at 0.5, right? So there's no perturbation at all into the system. But in the, in the modern lifestyle, we are not like that, right? So we are, we go catabolic, we go anabolic, right? So half an hour before we eat, right? And go to sleep, <laughs> the body's anabolic, but it says, you know, it has to be in the resting. So there's a lot of conflicting signals that we can give, uh, you know, in terms of the system that is operating. It is quite adaptive. And that is why the reason is that, you know, you don't have, uh, uh, you know, so many people, you know, still you have diabetes and all that coming in just because of these kinds of imbalance, imbalance that you have, right? Oxidative stress, your protein, the cancer, right? So now they're saying cancer, you know, fasting is the best, right? So you, you starve the cancer cells or tumor cells to get killed because they, they are highly ener uh, energetically uh, intense, right? So these kinds of insights uh, one can get by such input-output correlations, right? Understanding the dynamics. And that is what systems biology does for you, right? So you look at the regulatory components and then you want to know how the dynamics of the network uh, affect, right? So I can look at effect of diet and exercise. I can understand how immune cells are going, how immune cells operate, right? And you can look at modular way, you know, different components and then link them, okay? Time scales, you can look at oscillations, right? So all, all these kinds of, you know, what are relevant in terms of an output response given an input, that we can uh, sort of uh, correlate, okay? So uh, that's what I wanted to say, <laughs> that last 25 years, I've been, this is what I've been doing uh, in my research, you know, trying to understand how uh, biological systems operate, how the input output gets correlated, okay? And what is the input output uh, you know, signal to the system? Yeah, so I will do one final thing and then uh, I'll close. So uh, let me just see.
kezdem velem. Just a minute. You are able to see the screen or no? No, not yet. Ah, uh, yeah, uh, now, no? Yeah, yeah. What are you seeing? Uh, no, it is just a screen with something illegible. I cannot read. Sir, oh, it's okay. one is two class materials. Class oh, okay, materials. Okay, okay, I'm sorry, sorry, that is the wrong one. <laughs> Uh, now what do you see sir me met plus diabetic management ah yeah 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 so uh, with the models that i just told you right so i can now say some uid right so this is a, some patient number so i'll just say somebody is 45 years oops so i'll just say somebody is 45 years right uh, and then look at uh, say male uh, male with a height uh, oops Uh, 165. So I'm putting some random numbers just to indicate. <laughs> okay. So somebody is 75 kilos. Uh, his fasting glucose is uh, say 120, 125. Uh, Postprandial is say 220. Right. So he takes uh, say 3000 calories and he's taking very high amounts of carbs just to demonstrate I'm putting uh, the values here. Okay. 25 and then say kilo burnt is zero, it doesn't exercise. Okay, lifestyle is uh, sedentary, uh, that's also zero, right? So he's not taking any medication, it's zero. And then his body fat is say 32%, right? So now the I, I want to simulate, say, supposing I say 100 days, right? And the doctor says that no, 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 you reduce your calories, it is 3000, so you reduce it to 2400 calories, right? okay? And then he says, you know, take uh, carb less, okay? And then fat is some 20, right? Kilocal, when you start doing exercise, so you put 500 kilocal, you burn. Okay, you become moderately active, right? And then I will not give any dosage, right? So he says, just do this, right? So I can do this simulate. Okay, so the, the red one is, uh, you know, his normal response. So I've given diabetic, so he's already diabetic. Okay, and I'm sorry, the black one. Right. So the red dotted line is that we have taken thousand uh, patients, diabetic pa Indian patients, and we have benchmarked what is the healthy response, you know, in, in a teenager who has got very good metabolism. So they, that is the green, right? So that is the green. So if you take a healthy diet, your glucose dynamics should become like this. So in about two, two, two hours, right, two and a half hours, you should come back to your original steady state. This red one is for a diabetic patient. Okay. So anywhere in between you're pre-diabetic. So I can tell you, you know, how you are pre-diabetic. Okay. How close, if you're closer to the red, like, you know, in six months, you may become diabetic or one year, you may die. If you're closer to the green, that means that you're healthy, right? So this is the range for Indians. Okay. So this black is the current value. So based on his diet, lifestyle, and the calorie intake and all that is the black one. He's already diabetic. Okay. So if he does not care and continues with the same diet of 3000, doesn't exercise, high carb, then he will go to this. He'll become more diabetic. Okay, so that is that greenish curve that you have, so that he'll become more diabetic. Okay, now just by diet, he has taken 2400, he has started exercising, he's taking less carbohydrate, okay, reasonable amount of fat, and then he's become sedentary. See, he's become blue, right? So the black has become blue. Now he's become pre diabetic. Okay, he's still highly risky, but just the diet has brought him only the, you know, down, down this much. Okay, so. You can literally benchmark and then take a patient's history, adjust the parameter for that individual. You can now give a personalized suggestion because each individual is different, right? So his fat burning rate will be different. His medical medicine effect will be different, right? So we have built a platform for doctors who can optimize the diet for a, uh, a patient, right? Give his time series data, matches, uh, you know, based on his uh, diet and all that, you know, you match his uh, response. 
and then actually give the current predicted doctor uh, recommended right in a timeline study and then how he can reduce the weight what happens to his fasting glucose postprandial how is the you know glycosylated hemoglobin can from 7.6 it goes to 9.3 in the future and just by diet it has gone to 7.2 now supposing i say okay you start taking to 250 ng of uh, you know metformin every day okay see now it has come under control right so for this individual 250 ng of metformin is good enough like that you know we have uh, uh, insulin and we have other medicines also incorporated right so in in the company avatar the non academic avatar so we are building platforms like this for pcos ivf treatment you know immune compromising and allergies so we are using our systems biology to uh, you know predict or build platforms like this so that it will be useful for drug discovery it will be useful for you know doctors to manage disease you know overall wellness and other things like that okay so with that i will stop hmm Uh, stop sharing. Okay. sir yeah 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 ravin sir yes madam hello i'm i'm looking at some of the uh, chat <laughs> <laughs> yeah i can ask so there is i know uh, you know it, it can get a little overwhelming in the first shot um you know but uh, you can think about it uh let it seep into you and then you can contact me through email as well uh, if you have any uh, doubts okay uh so one of the things that people have commented on is evolution yeah that is a different ball game uh so there is now investigative ev uh, evolution that people are talking about so uh, you know the problem is the kind of data okay that you get and because now it is essentially dependent on statistics so you can play around okay you can you can play around a lot so there are a lot of uh, evolutionary genetics how the migration has happened you know people have commented you know there are a lot of papers that are coming okay so you have, you have to take it all with a, a pinch of salt because uh, you know the data that you have is quite less given the complexity and the people do genomic analysis and then give statistics statistical spin and then conclude which uh, conclude phenotypically which they should not they should just conclude based on the genom uh, genomic data that they have right so if you start commenting on the phenotypic response you know this migration happened that happened okay some uh, you know they, they're all would be still speculative and it may have some uh, merit right but i think we are not still there that you know we have the data to actually comprehend many of these uh, things but obviously in e coli yeast you know you can do because you can take something back so one of the questions that we can, we are asking is that there is a close relative of yeast okay which uses the same component as the glugal see the galactose me uh, metabolism that i uh, explained so it uses the same components same galati gal3 everything same components are same but the design is completely different okay so how is that you know one species has used the same component ancestry is the same okay they have the same component okay but the network is different okay <laughs> so we are, we are doing some analysis of this and trying to compare why you know this species probably dish was different okay yeast is usually on fruits and then it wants to use fructose galactose glucose you know which which are present and then this you know so so what is what is the evolutionary pressure that made them use the same component but come up with new designs right so such questions can be asked you know in microorganisms more than probably in higher organisms uh, but you know people are using fire this uh, dorsophila and earthworm and some some of the other systems to ask such uh, evolutionary questions because they can perturb and take it back when the generation then, time oh, is oh, very quick yeah 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 because they are very quick and yeah. you can you can you can analyze them uh, yeah yeah quick yeah thank you
ಮಚ್ so should i propose the vote of thanks yes please okay so it's an honor uh, on behalf of uh, yeah, association of teachers in biological sciences atbs and the department of biological sciences ram niranjan junjunwala college i extend my warm uh, uh, what's uh, it's a gratitude and thanks to professor venkatesh sir for sparing his valuable time and giving an excellent talk uh, on systems biology for me it was something new uh, and learned but i may i may require to learn it more uh, so on on behalf of atbs and junjunwala college i thank you sir i also thank uh, extend my thanks to all the atbs members and the staff teachers of uh, ram niranjan junjunwala college as well as uh, teachers of different colleges students of our college and different colleges for having attended this particular lecture series so i thank you all, all of you and uh, not the least i would also like to thank uh, mr devi prasad shetty for providing all the technical support for this particular lecture series so thank you well, once again one and all thank Thanks you thank you a lot it was a pleasure uh, interacting with you all thank yes. you sir thank yes. you okay thank bye bye you. thank you bye bye sir bye bye, bye. 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 bye.